Yeah, really such an honor to have been asked to be a part of this event. And when, when I received the call that uh, Cornelia had actually read my book and had taken some interest in my work, it was, it was kind of like winning a prize of my own. It was uh, really a wonderful thing. So delighted to be here. And now I, I'm a writer, so unlike, I, I may be the only person in the room tonight who uh, doesn't do anything at all practical or hands-on in his daily life. So I've been asked to frame some of the big emerging ideas at the intersection of people and nature. And I wanted to start by just taking a moment to remember that nature still has this power to thrill us. And so this is a photo that was taken in 2010 of a, of a gray whale that paid us a visit and came all the way in to False Creek. And I think uh, many of you might remember this. Um, thousands of people went down to False Creek to, to see the whale, and I have a favorite online video. Uh, it's pretty rough, so it's not really worth watching, but in it, you can hear about five different languages. Uh, at one point, you can see construction workers in their tool belts and hard hats actually running down a bridge to get a better look at this whale, and the whole thing is shot by this skateboarder dude who, who at the end you know, holds his phone selfie style and says, essentially that whales are so sick. <laughs> and so people from every walk of life were, were just absolutely thrilled by the presence of this whale. You can see how close people were able to get to it. It's that shining kind of half, uh, half circle there, right under people's noses. And uh, at the time when this whale showed up, most people talked about it as a chance event or a once in a lifetime experience. And, and Today, that's true. But if we step back 150 years ago, there were hundreds of whales in this area. So the, the event was more like memory come back to life. We had uh, not only gray whales that migrated through this area, we had hundreds of uh, year-round population of uh, humpback whales. And humpback whales, of course, are those whales that sing the haunting underwater songs. And people fly to Mexico to see humpbacks, and people fly to Hawaii to see humpbacks. And if we had maintained that whale population, uh, we'd be able to do that kind of whale watching from the Burrard Street Bridge. So Vancouver at that time was a, a place of whales. The, there was a whaling station on Bowen Island. There was a whaling station for a time on Jericho Beach. One of the first settlers, first European settlers in the Vancouver area was a guy nicknamed Peter the Whaler. And so that's starting to probably give you a sense of where all those whales went. This is uh, a whale that was taken in the Strait of Georgia, a humpback whale, and processed out at uh, the whaling station in Nanaimo. So by 1908, every single one of the local whales had been killed. So this is the first rule of historical ecology. To know what is, we must know what was. So if you're not aware that whales ever lived in this place, then the absence of the whales will seem to be the normal state of things. But if you do become aware that we used to have the whales, then it becomes the abnormal state uh, to have no whales in this place. And then it becomes possible to ask questions like, could we bring them back again? So I just want to give you a, another couple examples in order to build a bit of a quick overview of the natural world in Vancouver when, visit, or when Europeans were first visiting the area. So we had 120 kilometers of fish-bearing streams within the city limits of Vancouver proper. 120 kilometers of streams that had uh, sea-run cutthroat trout and salmon in them. And people talked about fishing with pitchforks, and people talked about there used to be a ravine that ran down where uh, Canby and Broadway meet today. And there's an old pioneer journal where they talk about going down and fishing under the little bridge that was there. Um, Almost every inch of those waterways has been buried by the city. You may know the stories of the great clouds of passenger pigeons that were known from the east coast of North America. We had the same thing here with our seabirds and our shorebirds. Uh, again, another old timer's journal describes them out there by the thousands and millions and rising as one to literally darken the whole western sky. We had tremendous old growth forests here. 
Uh, Gastown and Jericho were particularly well known for the, the, their incredible trees. There were trees standing in those areas that were taller than any tree standing in any part of Canada today. And so I've included an image here of the, this is Eugenia Place, a condo development on Beach Avenue. And that, it's famous for the, for the oak tree, the pin oak up on top. But that building and the oak were designed to represent the height of the original forest. So that gives you some sense of, of what we had there. So yeah, early journal entries and, and sea captains logs and so on, they describe grizzly bears here, uh, elk, wolverines, wolves, all of these species that today we associate really only with remote wilderness areas. But along with all of those, we also had thousands of First Nations people living in Vancouver Harbor and the, the uh, Fraser River Delta. So this place that became Vancouver was in no way a wilderness. It was this very rich intersection of nature and human culture and holds out the promise that perhaps it could be that again. So an important question is how do we, how do we forget what the natural world used to look like? And many of you may have heard of this idea of shifting baseline syndrome. So shifting baseline syndrome is a, a state where uh, each generation looks around and sees the natural world around them as normal. And they then measure the degradation of the environment against that baseline. Then along comes the next generation and they do the same thing. So what has become the degraded state of nature for one generation becomes the normal state of nature for the following generation. And as you can guess, uh, as the baseline shifts generation by generation, we can really lose sight of what the, the original state of nature may have looked like. And if you're having trouble picturing that, don't worry because a, a young marine biologist uh, did it for us. She went down to the Florida Keys and uh, Florida Keys, of course, being that chain of islands that comes off the southern tip of Florida. Uh, it was made famous, famous by Ernest Hemingway for its deep sea fishing and those sorts of things. So this biologist went and found a fishing charter company that had taken photos of its clients on the same dock from the 1950s through to today. And so here's a photo from 1958. Um, bit of a beachcombers feel to it, but uh, you can see the fish are, are big, and there's plenty of them. Uh, fish are almost as big as the, the people who caught them. And here's one from the 1980s, and now here's 2007. So d does anyone notice any differences? Um, obviously the fish got smaller and smaller and fewer in number. Uh, but where you see the shifting baseline syndrome is not, is not only in the fish, but in the fishermen. So the woman who did the study, whose name is uh, Lauren McLennican, she points out that in the photos through the years that she looked at, the, the, the sense of pride and the, and the delight in the faces of the fishermen never changes, even as the fish gets smaller and smaller. Each generation is just happy to be catching the biggest fish in the sea as they know it. And so she told me that uh, even when she shows these photos to fishermen in Florida, some of them just outright refuse to believe that there ever were bigger fish in the sea. And she herself has been going down to the Florida Keys with her family since she was a child. And she says, you know, where she used to see the ocean as pristine, now she sees the ghosts of all the things that were lost there. And she says she has become a big bummer for family vacations. <laughs> so there's a couple ways we can look at this information. One is that familiar sense of, of loss and that guilt. Uh, here's another bad things that we humans have done. On the other end, we can be inspired by the abundance of the past. Once we know what nature was like in the past, we can use that knowledge to set a higher bar for what the normal state of nature might be in the future. And this takes us to this idea of rewilding. Here's one of our handsome Vancouver coyotes. Um, there's a few definitions for rewilding floating around, but I use the word in its broadest sense. To me, if you're rewilding, then you're bringing back wild qualities to places they've been lost. So that can occur anywhere from quite wild areas to, uh, to the most urban centers. And rewilding is 
not the same as traditional conservation. Traditional conservation focused on uh, protecting nature. It focused on saving those last best wild places or keeping endangered species from going extinct. And conservation has obviously been incredibly important. It'll continue to be very, very important. But it also had an unfortunate side effect, and that is that it separated people and nature. So nature went into protected areas over here, and people get to use everything else. And we're running up against the limits of that at this point. So the most ambitious target agreed upon by the international community for the protection of land and sea surface of the planet would set aside 12% of the surface of the planet in protected areas. That leaves 88% of the planet outside of protected areas. And this, I think, is where rewilding becomes very important. You know, if we want to live in a world that's ecologically whole in any real way, or if we want to live in a world where nature is anything like what we know it to have been in the past, then we have to do more than just set nature aside in parks. We have to start rebuilding nature, uh, rewilding everywhere. So if the Margulies Prize rewards design for living, then I think what rewilding about is about is design for living alongside other species. And it's interesting to note that other species are often quite happy to live alongside us. Uh, this is a couple of bighorn rams, and it looks like an image from the calendar, from a, you know, from a wilderness calendar or something like that. But these are from a herd of bighorn sheep that moved onto an active mine site in Alberta. So the mine had ended up, uh, the work of the mine had produced artificial cliffs. The bighorn sheep moved onto those. And they found it very easy to, uh, to work around the mine schedule. I, I think there's a Bugs Bunny uh, cartoon or something like this where you know there's that change of shifts and it was kind of like that the miners would go home at five and the sheep would move onto the cliffs and in the past uh, a mine might have driven the sheep off or they may you know might have even killed the herd off something like that in this case they decided to accommodate the bighorn and so they did things like well they permitted them to stay on the cliffs they didn't scare them away and they reseeded some of their landscape with native grasses so the sheep had something to eat today this is one of the rocky mountains healthiest herds of bighorn in fact it's so healthy that its uh, seed populations from this herd are being taken down to the united states to and reintroduced in places that have lost their bighorn uh, so it's become a the, the bighorn rewilded themselves, and now we are rewilding the bighorn. And examples like this help remind us that right now we design our environments for only one species, typically, and that's us, human beings. Uh, but with some creativity, we can, we can accommodate other species. This is a human-made bat cave in Mexico. Um, you know, they don't ask for a lot. Uh, in Poland, you can actually, you can go to the, uh, sort of, I don't know what they call it, but it's the Polish equivalent of Canadian Tire. And you can pick yourself up a stork kit that you can put on the roof of your house to attract storks to nest on the top of your house. And, and there are stork villages, you know, villages compete to have the most storks uh, on the roofs of their homes. I think Cornelia in her work and writing is pointed, I've, I've struggled with this, you know, what are the principles that we might, you know, within which we might frame rewilding in cities and so on. And uh, in reading Cornelia's work, I struck on a couple of points uh, that I think help us think differently about how people in nature might re-engage. And one is this idea of least intervention. You know, when we build, whatever we build, we can try to do the least possible harm to existing ecological systems. And the other, as you just heard, is this idea of invisible mending, uh, re restoring and seamlessly weaving nature back into human designs. So I think some of the most fascinating projects in rewilding are going to happen first in the cities. And so this is a project called Animal Wall, and it was actually designed by an artist named Gittige Schwentner. And this is, <clears throat> this is in Cardiff, Wales. And the goal here was to match 1,000 housing units for people with 1,000 housing units for different kinds of birds and bats. And uh, last time I spoke to her, it had uh, 
I think about 15% occupancy. So this tells us other species are more, uh, you know, a little more cautious about real estate than we are. So a critical part of this is reconnection with nature. And you often hear people talk about reconnecting with nature as something that we ought to do. You know, we ought to eat more fiber, uh, we ought to donate blood, and we ought to reconnect with nature. But in fact, reconnecting with nature is it's critically important to all of this. Because if we don't have a connection with nature, then we won't want to bring it back into the humanized world. And if we don't bring it nature back into the humanized world, then uh, we end up with a much poorer, much less healthy, and, and above all, I think, much less magical uh, planet. I suspect most people in this room would probably agree that as a society, we've you know, we've started to become concerned about our level of disconnection from nature, and you know this is the case when it starts appearing in advertisements. Uh, so this is the top half of an advertisement that helps us identify the birds of North America, including such common species as the whatchamacallit, the blue-winged thingamabob, and the what's-its-name. So the creators of this ad are trying to suggest that the best way to reconnect with nature is to purchase an SUV. Uh, but uh, I, I decided that there might be other, other ways to approach this. So as part of my book, I did several personal experiments in just actively paying attention to nature. And the first one was very simple. I went down to Trout Lake in East Vancouver. I sat down at the edge of the lake, and I spent one hour paying attention to nature. And I'd only been sitting for a couple minutes when uh, this drama broke out. All of the ducks on the surface of the lake went crazy. The ducks that could dive were diving. The ones that, couldn't, that can't dive were paddling away with their wings. Even the little birds in the trees around the lake spiraled down into the undergrowth. And then this shadow came rippling out across the water, and it was the dreaded beak thing. So it was a, a bald eagle hunting ducks, and it narrowed in on these three ducks. And at the last second, the ducks shot off in three different directions. And the, the eagle came up uh, empty, empty taloned, I guess one would say. And uh, so this was this wildlife documentary quality moment in the, in the heart of the city. And the first thing I noticed afterwards was that no one else had noticed. Uh, there were people running around the lake, walking around the lake. It was a beautiful day. People were actually throwing sticks into the lake for their dogs to retrieve. But it was very clear that nobody had really noticed this, uh, this great wild drama that had played out in front of their eyes. And I had to acknowledge to myself that had I not gone down there with the specific task of paying attention to nature, then I wouldn't have noticed it either. And I mentioned this to a journalist friend in New York, and he said, oh yeah, uh, these days people are more likely to see those sorts of scenes in online videos. So, I went online, and sure enough, I found a bunch of bald eagle hunting ducks videos. Uh, there was one from Seattle that had 150,000 hits. So clearly, we still want to see these things. Uh, and I also found this photo series that kind of captured my experience perfectly. And in this case, the photographer had an even more dramatic experience. He, uh, he saw this sort of 10 minutes of aerial combat between these two eagles that culminated in a midair collision between the two eagles. You can, you can see what looks like one eagle there uh, is two eagles colliding in midair. And the photographer also pointed out that, uh, that everyone else around the lake missed this whole, this whole scene. Um, he pointed in particular, my big red arrow points to a guy on uh, the tailgate of his truck. Naturally, he looks like he is, he's texting uh, on his phone. And I imagine him texting, you know, hey, I'm down at the lake. Maybe I'll see an eagle, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, but one of the eagles actually, after the collision, one of the eagles actually ended up in the water and was drowning. But it managed to get its wings up onto the surface and fly up to a tree. And the photographer said that this bedraggled eagle symbolizes America in its current trials. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps more true than ever now. But no need to worry about America, because a half hour later, the eagle was ready to appear on a coin, pretty much. Uh, ready for action there. So 
I went on from my experience with the eagle to do one other experiment in reconnection, and, and that's what I want to leave you with uh, by doing just a short reading from the book. So here we go. Nature remains a more hopeful place than the news about it might suggest. I recently joined three professional biologists for 24 straight hours of bird watching. We started at 1 a.m., climbing high into the mountains in order to spend the day descending through every possible kind of habitat on our way back to the valley floor. By the following night, we'd encountered 117 species of bird. The biologists were disappointed, but to me it seemed miraculous. 117 species. It was more kinds of bird in a single day than I had knowingly seen in my entire life. They were everywhere from spruce grouse pecking across the snowfields to an enormous great horned owl. Outraged, we discovered him in his canyon lair. There was a time when religious scholars sought to relate every species to the primacy of human beings. Lice were our incentive to cleanliness. Deer kept our meat fresh until we needed it. Horse shit smelled sweeter than other turds because horses were chosen to live alongside us. For the most part, we've less left such thoughts behind, yet the way we shutter ourselves away from nature has much the same effect today, making it easy to believe that only our species is at the center of creation. It's a difficult worldview to sustain in the presence of the ruby-crowned kinglet, a bird that weighs less than a handful of coins and sings in forests so cold and high that no human culture in history has ever lingered there for long. The biologists and I didn't only see birds. We saw bats and beavers and, and a pine marten. We saw snakes and two black bears. We saw what is not meant to be seen, the twin tips of a mule deer's ears where it hid in a stand of cattails and a doe in secret stillness on her daybed. And we were able to see with our own eyes the vulnerability of so many creatures, the way that Lewis's woodpeckers appeared only in a solitary gully of wildfire blackened trees, or cliff swallows gathered the damp clay to mud their gourd-shaped nests from a single puddle between a highway and a parking lot. So much life and such precariousness of life. In only a single day of careful observation, the, wildlife, or the wild landscape came to seem infinitely more alive, more abundant, more full of purpose than I'd remembered, and because of that, more worthy of care. It remains a beautiful world, and it is its beauty, far more than its emptiness, that can inspire us to seek more nature in our lives and in our world. Thanks very much.